pharmaceutical companies are looking for ways to leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning within the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry. Reports show that an increasing number of companies are realizing current use cases, which is driving the digital future of the technology in the industry. As all of us know, AI and machine learning will play a critical role in drug discovery, drug manufacturing, diagnostic assistance, and optimizing medical treatment processes, according to many of the industry stakeholders. In today's webinar, one such use case, visual inspection, will be discussed in details by Vijay Yadav. Good afternoon, I'm Uday Shetty, and you're watching another session of Pharma Best Practices webinar. Today's webinar is 121st webinar since this platform was launched way back in March 2020. We appreciate each one of you joining today, and we do hope that you're enjoying these webinars as much as we are enjoying hosting these for you. We are pleased with that. With this, uh, with this platform, we were able to reach more than 200,000 pharma professionals all over the world who have either watched our sessions live or on-demand access. This is what keeps us going. Uh, let me now introduce today's subject matter expert, Vijay Yadav. Vijay is the Director of Quantitative Sciences at Merck, and he is accountable for driving data and analytics strategy. So without further ado, I will hand over this virtual stage to Vijay so that he can give his full introduction and thereafter make his presentation. Over to you, Vijay, for your presentation. Thank you. That's so much. Um, good morning here in the US. Good afternoon and good evening, all of you. Uh, I'm happy to join. Uh, my name is Vijay Yadav. I am heading the data science team for Merck Manufacturing Division. And I have been in, you know, uh, applying AI ML for, for some time now, uh, especially in, in pharmaceutical and chemical uh, uh, areas. Uh, manufacturing has been some of my uh, work that I have done applying, but I have applied AI ML in other business functions as well. For example, you know, operations, finance, supply chain. But this use case I'm going to present today uh, is on how do we apply AI um, ML for visual inspection. So let's get this started. <clears throat> so, so here is a area that we want to understand. So what is the business driver for this use case? I'll give you a little bit of, of uh, background on this, right? So if you think about how the drug product manufacturing process takes place, right? You see on the left-hand side, the incoming goods, formulation, fill, you know, stopper, you basically cap it, you do an inspection, and then after that, you package it and you ship it, you know, in to the warehouse, and from there, basically, distribution takes place. Now, in this manufacturing process, right, so think about the schedule quantity that is showing the blue bar. That's a quantity schedule. That's what is planned for in the manufacturing process. Out of that, you see there's a green line bar that is showing this is actually how much is deliver, delivered. So that means there was some loss that took place. If you add up all those red dots that will fill in the gaps that was basically lost in the process. Um, so the, the main thing that we're going to look into is the, the big red block there, the ejected automated inspection. So we all know that you know every product must be inspected. Uh, every unit of the pharma product must be inspected either by human eyes or by, by machines. Of course, humanly, it is not possible to inspect when we are talking about mass production, you know, millions of units a day. So for that, actually, the, there are machines that are taking a picture of the products, and we'll, we'll look into that a little bit more down the line. How does that work? And you know, the machines are looking at the, each product and, you know, based on certain GMP processes, uh, they determine whether a product is defective or not, and they eject the units. And those ejections are, um, and we're calling ejection, uh, you know, some companies 
uh, use a kind of uh, uh, a process where I can review, but you know, within Merck, I think we do just once it comes out the GMP process is basically out. So historical data that you see, this is the you know one of the biggest the red block that you see is the biggest contribution of the yield loss. So think about from pharmaceutical company point of view. You know, especially for Merck, some of the products we cannot manufacture enough to meet the demand. So if there's there's two ways you can increase your output. And one is you set up a new plant, right? And then you go through the whole process and you basically meet the demand that way. So while that in the process, that takes a lot of time, at least five to eight years to set up a new plant. But then we can go back and look at the existing plants and see where can we improve the yield. And this is one of the source of yield um, that you see here loss. So the idea is what can we do in order to improve that yield? So normally in general for almost other pharmaceutical company as well, somewhere between four to 6% is your yield loss. If you think about all the red blocks that you join out of let's say 4% is the number then you 80% is the false ejects. I mean, literally in an average, you have 3% of the products are getting thrown away. In general, in the industry, that's the data that we have seen. Now, that's a lot. You know, it seems like 3% is not a whole lot, but to think about the business driver for this, by the time it comes to the automated inspection, all the materials, labor, machine time, planning, everything has been invested. It is just at the very end where the machines are inspecting they're ejecting good product as defective, right? And if there's anything that can be done to improve that, that's what the business case is. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, it's a very strong uh, business case. You know, you cannot come up with, you know, business case like this where you're directly impacting the yield of the manufacturing process. So with that, let's move on. So this is what the existing, a very typical, existing process looks like. So you see in the automated machines um, there, right? So machines are looking at the product and there are two paths that product can go. One is the ejected path, discards so the red down arrow that you see. And the right side, you see the good units where the uh, good units are getting identified by the machines. Now, please remember that these machines are not using any type of AI ML model. These machines are using a very heuristic rule-based, logic-based software. Cameras are taking the picture from the product assembly line, and that camera is basically connected to a computer and determines whether a product is defective or not based on certain sequences within the vision software that is provided by the you know, machines manufacturer, um, and then they determine uh, whether something is defective or not. And there are a lot of sequences, a lot of logics that is basically coded as part of the determination. So we talk about uh, ejected path. So what happens is we still want to know as a, as a requirement that all these ejection taking place at discards, um, what kind of defects are are there and why it is what does basically ejected population looks like of course it is not possible to inspect each unit manually the ejected ones right um so you basically take a sample so whatever ejection came and sample could be timing based or it could be at the end but you you know you take a sample of ejected material and then you determine you know what kind of defects basically it is found at that time it's all all manual and human eyes basically looking at inspecting it and finding out what it is so that is a sample based you know sampling and then you find determine the uh, you know what does the defect basically looks like right so that's the path the right hand side is that even within the good units that is com coming out of the machines, there's a whole ma you know, manual sampling process, accepted quality limits that you see, statistical sampling, 
it is done just to make sure that nothing is creeping into the good units or by by mistake or by machines right so then you're doing that and there's a limit for that as to you know how what kind of critical defects can come through this so hopefully through the green route there's nothing critical defects are coming in uh, there might be some minor things that uh, may happen but uh, each companies have defined what is accepted what is not accepted and how many units are you know kind of uh, accepted to be a good lot right and if there's a control limit and the control limit basically is hits that's where the open investigates in open to look into that as to what happened why you know defective critical units are creeping into into the production um, side of it right and that's all production rework batch you open the investigation and 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 do things after the investigation it depends you know how critical what was that and you know recommendation for disposition of the batch is basically taking place right so let's understand what is the problem with this existing process. Two problems are primarily in this. Number one, if you see we are doing the sampling based, right? Especially the ejected path. Um, and sample is only a small sample. If you want to really get a true picture of the entire ejected population and see what happened, that is even giving a much better view of population more more accurate i would say not not non-accurate but it is it is giving a full picture of what is happening right so if somehow we can apply uh, a technique where not only we are taking the manual sample but um take the whole picture of that and see understand that from uh, that perspective right um the second is when and by the way this picture that you see here on the screen it's all GMP, right? Everything's GMP here. Now, if if the user and people who are working and if let's say out of a hundred thousand batch, if we got let's say five thousand ejected units, right? And it is very difficult to go navigate one by one all those images and see which images when, and you don't have a time for the next batch, right? So even the manual time it effort is take to go through the folder and um, understand what happened. Even even the sample one is difficult to get those images uh, as well. So the time consumption is really really high in terms of if someone wants to look into understand what happened. So those are two things that are basically we are trying to solve the problem with this, right? So let's move on to the <clears throat> slide. So what we want to really see here, understand um, what happened in the process. So there are two sources of data that's coming in. You see the you see a data lake. So incoming goods, form and fill, um, stopper, all those data is basically coming and uh, collected the data and we are basically getting the data lake and we're creating the insights out of that right which camera is rejecting you know most which machine which machine is functioning properly or not so there's a process data that's coming through the whole data lake but there's the image data that we are collecting the right hand side you see the 100 percent ejected units are basically sent to a system a product called hawk avi and this solution has three capability or four capability total right so one thing is that you have to ingest the images so all these images coming out of those inspection machine we need to ingest those images into the cloud ingestion is really and we'll talk about the challenging element of that right so it's not only ingest the images as it is information about the images has to be captured as well so for example if i if there's the image which product it is and which machine it came from which site and all those information date and time stamps and batch number all those information has to be captured as well right along with um along with the image data so once the images are collected 
then think about you know some of you if you're in IT space you can use the for example SQL query as structured query language to query your data um, you know you, you specify some criteria that you know I want to look at this here is the site I'm interested in here's some product I'm interested in and basically you source you the data imagine if that kind of query can be enabled just to query the images itself I'm interested so many for this batch number how many ejected images are there I want to have a look at them give me which machine ejected the most you know you can basically literally almost any criteria you can take it and filter it and now you're looking at those images live right there right once the batch is over collected then you can basically query it now the user has much faster way to look at these images look at these defects and understand that and then you can go back and fix your gmp process so by the way this tool the one you're seeing in hawk abi is a non-gmp this is more like a diagnostic tool once the batch is over this tool is basically giving insights about that batch understand so and gets the insights and learn from the insights and go back and fix your uh you know gmp process so for example let's say through this solution the insights telling that hey you're getting a lot of well marks now we all know the well marks you know it could come from the vial manufacturers themselves or within the facility if it is washed the units are washed before they go on the production line washed and you know dried and sterilized um, and then they're sent to the production line now somehow if the drying process the moisture is left between the two vials and you send it to a sterilization process then they will stick together and when they separate out you have the well mark this tool can give the insight that in this particular batch you just finished you, you got this many well marks of course they were rejected but now you can go back upstream process and tell them hey your upstream process your drying process is not working right so you can go back and basically um you know look into an up, upstream process uh, there could be situation where machine can be retuned right of course the retuning is a gmp process so if something is happening then you can retune the machine and you can go back and follow gmp process to make a changes so again this is giving um uh, diagnostic insights more like giving a flashlight in the dark and just to see where it looks for and make a determination take a decision what needs to happen in the process and then try to improve the yield so i was talking about the image query pretty powerful you know capabilities very unique um, you know querying the data is one thing but querying an image is another uh, and that is that itself is a big value how quickly you can look into the images that came out of the system and then the Hawk ABI AI ML models. These are the models that we we kind of have developed in house. Um, and models, as you know, the way they works is that you have a label data where, let's say, uh, a well marks. We got you know thousands of well marks sample for machine to look into that. This is what the well marks looks like. This is what the crack looks like. This is what. Um, you know product splash or any physical defect or different types of defect right so literally you give provide a labeled a known defect to these models and they will learn from it and learn to the extent whereby you can um they're mature enough to if you show them new defect they can tell you uh, what this, what kind of defect it is so that's the idea behind the model and so information coming out of the model in, and coming to data lake, that basically forms the basis for the entire insights that we have. So that's how the use case basically functions. So let's go a little bit deeper into that. <clears throat> so um, in terms of, you know, at this very high level, um, it doesn't give you the very breakdown of all the details, technical details, but it gives you the basically a flow so so think about how the image data is captured there's a production server and this event that basically takes place when the batch is over that's event it all the images are transferred into the cloud it's used for s3 bucket if you know 
AWS platform. And all the images as they arrive, they are queued. And <clears throat> there are the models which are listening to those queues. And they pick up images one by one and then make the inference and so you know save inference, right? Inference meaning what kind of defect it is, and then save into a database, right? Um, and that is the databases, and you see there's uh, two paths coming in. One is the inference path coming through the model, but there's a metadata ingestion element of that going to a D, uh, DynamoDB database. So what that basically means is that when the image arrives, the information about the image that's captured. So what is the product ID for that image? What machine it came from? What camera number it came from? All those information extracted from that uh, piece and saved into database. And then the whole outcome from the model comes from the inference path. So now at that time, you know what, what those ejected images are and what is the inferences. And then you can see the image query runs off of that database. Um, and that's the index and searching. So the fact that we're talking millions of images, right? So you got to have a very powerful indexing and searching mechanism. And that's what the database app is using the image query app and also index searching to determine. And I'll, I'll show you one example uh, of data viz app. That is what the insights is. This is the system app is telling the insights and we'll, we'll see the sample. And users are interacting with the data viz app, image query app to get the insights they want. And you see the, you saw earlier in my get diagram where uh, some of the data was coming from the process data uh, from different uh, processes, for example, filling, formulation, all those. So that data is directly flowing in into data lake and that's also coming to data viz app to provide that. So at a very high level, this is the flow of the solution uh, to look like. I'm just watching the time just to make sure that uh, <clears throat> I'm covering um, the solution. Uda, do we want to take any question here or should we wait to the end? I think we'll have questions at the end, all of it. Okay, all right, let's do that. Yeah. Then. And you have sufficient time, so take your time explaining the concepts, no problem. <clears throat> oh, all right, no problem, I'll do that. So let's understand that. <clears throat> So this is this one type of uh, a, a sample of the defects that you basically see. So you see the crack, right? Um, and then you see the false eject. So that's a good product, but that's that came as a defective, right? Then you see the well mark, and use a product splash. Product splash is basically um, in in certain products. It, it, especially if there's a cake type of product within <clears throat> within a vial, then you don't want to be splicing on the wall, right? And cap and everywhere else, right? So that's a kind of defect. Now, so, so think about the way the model basically works. So see at the top, <clears throat> in this particular use case, there are 26 cameras that are taking picture of every unit. So as the unit is passing by on the assembly line, it's pretty fast. I mean, it's running like your eyes may not be able to see these units. But as these machines, as the units is passing through, it's rotating vertically and horizontally at a very fast speed. And there are 26 cameras basically last from different directions are taking picture of every unit. If any of the cameras says that, hey, I found defective, then it's going to be ejected. So almost literally, so, um, so uh, kind of into it that there's there's very less chance of something coming out of that and not defect getting detected because cameras are looking from different directions. So the camera that number you see, camera three five seven nine. These four cameras are looking for one type of defect, which is basically the physical. Uh, appearance of that vial. All these four R4 cameras are looking just for the physical defect of the vial. But there are other cameras who are looking inside material as well, the product inside it, right? And looking to see if there's something in the product itself. So that's how this purpose of each camera group is because they're looking for certain defects. 
So you can imagine if there are 26 camera, there are you know certain some cases there are two cameras that are paired for one type of defect. There are four cameras are looking for one type of defect. There are single camera looking for one type of defect. So it's pretty cumbersome basically process, and that's how it, it works. Now the model that you see, since all these four cameras are looking for one defect, so there's one AI model for that defect combining uh, for these four camera groups to determine something is defective or not. So in that model, these are different types of defects that model determines whether some it is got a crack, whether they got a well marks, the product splash, or if nothing else, then that means potentially it is a false ejects, meaning that's a good product. So let's look into our insights. So we talk about, and here is here's a situation that you see. So in the x-axis we see, you see letter A1, so A1, C03, C05, C07, C09. That is A machine one. So A1 means that's one machine, that's one machine station. And there's a second machine station is, you can see A2, there are two separate stations and there are again 26 camera in each. And this model, um, this particular model is of course for camera 3579. If you look at the all the A ones, right? A1, C03, C05, C07, C09. The red represents the well mark, right? And blue represents the product splash, right? And that's a different color. Now if you think about what is what is wrong with this picture, what is happening here? So think about if there is a well mark, you would think that all cameras should be catching up all all three five seven nine. They should be catching up the um, well mark for the most part too close to the same number. But you see the camera number seven. Somehow it is the well mark is much higher. If you see the three and five they are almost equal c9 it has a little bit more but c7 it has a lot more well mark now so if you think about the use case as to why other cameras are not seeing those well marks only seven is seeing so many high right so potentially you know chances of something a kind of logic is not not that high that this would be different right this would be almost very similar, this would be close vicinity, right? Something is about seven is happening there. What it gives a picture to the people, again, this is a diagnostic tool. What it basically gives the picture to the people on the production floor that, okay, something is happening with camera number seven. Either it is not configured right, or maybe it has moved, or there might be something happening. Now it gives them an insight to go back and look into camera number seven and understand and go and fix it. One particular case, I think this was something that the camera was, um, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, the way it was configured, um, sequencing uh, steps uh, that was different than the camera 3579, right? So then you were able to go back and, and quickly fix it. And then all of, after that, I think the problem got fixed and now, you can see the improvement the yield, right? So those delta and camera number seven, all those camera seven was finding what are getting thrown out, right? But if you can fix it to see the delta between three, five, seven, nine, whatever the left, the good units getting thrown by camera seven, now able to capture after the GMP process is validated after making the changes. So it's pretty powerful insights for someone to use the technique and go back and, and look into that. You could not find this in any normal situation. If you just if you just leave that as if there's no other way to find this particular problem, unless you go back and look into and have a tool like this to provide the insights and make the change um, to happen, right? So it's pretty strong um, use case for for getting insights to fix the GMP process.
so just to give you a little bit more and some of you if you are not technical um, i can still give you some uh, more information about that so uh, what kind of technology we are using in this particular case so uh, it is aws uh, based platform let's see here uh, So it's AWS shop, right? Um, and so AWS has Amazon, uh, is a SageMaker is a machine learning and AI platform. That's what is basically using that. So it, that platform is used for prototyping, right? So anytime we develop a model, um, this whole prototyping piece, we go and explore the data, right? So if we want to dev, you know, develop a new model, then we have to understand, okay, what kind of defect this this model is going to capture? What do the different defects look like? And you go through the recognition process, labeling process, um, and then you know you train the model and test the accuracy of the model and work on that. Now, normally when we develop the model, you don't send the raw images to the models to train because in the raw images there's a lot of noise, right? So this whole pre-processing takes place. You take the image and process to the extent that to model it is very clear as to what defect it is. Um, earlier you saw the black and white. The model is looking at a little different pre-processed image where, for example, crack, if you reverse, your black becomes white and white becomes black. Now, where you saw the crack, it was showing in the white. In the pre-process setting, Everywhere it was black will become white and white becomes black. Now model is looking into the background and says where the crack looks like in the black, right? So you can recognize a much better way. And sometimes if there are, uh, if you look at any pixels of the image, uh, there's a whole gray area. So you want to convert into a smooth uh, background where you should be able to see the defect much clearly, right? So. If there's some gray area, then you can convert everything to white. And then you leave the defect more prominent. Uh, so the model can basically say it. So, so this, that's whole and uh, pre-processing is basically taking place. And then you have the machine learning and deep learning training and testing, and you basically deploy that, uh, you deploy the model. And that's whole uh, TensorFlow ecosystem that exactly takes place. Some of the techniques there to do it. So, so here are some of the piece, and I I, I don't want to um, get you bored with this, but this is some of the more information as to how uh, the model, what kind of uh, techniques that's being used. So the concept behind the hyperparameter is, is so, so think about the way the model is trained is, right? What we call a feature. So think about for someone, if I give you a crack and if I show you 10 cracks, now your mind is basically trained what cracks looks like, right? If I show you the 11th one, you can tell whether something's crack or not. So think about the learning of the human process. We look at certain things and we're extracting what a cracks looks like. So in our mind, it is kind of almost transparent to you, but there's something taking place in human brain is you look at the crack all years of your life, you basically have seen what cracks looks like and you can immediately tell anytime somebody shows you, see the crack is, so think about the human learning. How did you know a crack is a crack? A well mark is a well mark. Because what you're doing is in your mind as a human, you are you're capturing the features of a crack. What does a feature look like? You know, and those features are the one is imprinted in your mind to look and see what a crack, a well mark, any type of things looks like. Because we as a human have learned all those features for different type of things right um to do that so 
same concept is getting replicated in a machine that what is the feature of being a crack buyer what is the feature of being a uh, you know well mark and that is what the whole idea behind you know deep learning models do that that's that is what exactly do is they create a feature and which is more like a signature right so think about crack has its own signature well mark has its own signature and it creates signature and that is what is making the learning process next time if a vial is sent to that model it uses the same technique to create a signature it does the same thing for the any new vial and goes and match signature by signature right so think about how we how uh, any automated signature of your physical signature is matched exactly in the same way right so we all have our handwriting for example unique how is that different every time you write and people can match your signature because each signature had its own behind attribute in the background they stored and then anytime you sign it basically matches it tells you whether it's your signature or not very similar concept right to do that so so then there's a whole um, if there are and by the way so when we create a feature for a crack we're talking about the multi almost million features could be within that right hundreds of them there's there's not one or two or three features there are many of them end of the day we want to tune those features to make sure that the model is giving the best performance right so in testing process so there's a whole tuning element of that which feature is more prominent than the other one and you want to give the weight to that feature more than the one which is not impacting in a big way so all these different features impact the they contribute to the model in different way they may have some significant contribution to the outcome and there are some features who have less contribution so end of the day you want to go back and see which one you want to give more weight to that which one to less weight and all those is not a human kind of process machines are doing themselves and that's why we're calling hyperparameter tuning I meaning it's taking the parameter is more like an you know uh, features and automatically goes and just it takes all permutation and combinations and it can run millions of permutation and combinations and finds okay this combination is the best it is giving the model performance that's the idea behind the hyperparameter um <clears throat> so so whole data engineering element is, is is a challenging piece right so so think about we talked about the information about the image right so the metadata so metadata concept is data about data so i want to image is the data i want to know what what in other information is about that image which batches came from which process came from some of the static metadata um uh, what is the file name which basically contains the product name so all those information about the images are basically captured as a metadata and that is what powers your query app so imagine you have an image but you have every piece of information about that image right where it was stored what was the file name what is all the batch information about that image what process it came from the process pfi data limbs data any static metadata whereby it says the batch number product number um building number for example uh, site code or um any information which is static nature that's also there and also we talked about the model inference so once the model infers the outcome you saw the diagram then what was the outcome of that that's also stored as a metadata and then the whole model catalog which model was used to create this outcome right so you want to know that which model name which model version created that outcome you want to store that as well so all those information is basically part of the data engineering a pretty challenging piece of work there as well so extracting the data from that image so you saw the image earlier whereby um, as the images are created by the machines and the moment they are saved on to the production server that's the event trigger it triggers that something new came in and that's where 
things start moving around, right? So at that time, even triggers and what we call a lambda function uh, as part of the technology, it, it triggers itself and it start determining, okay, what arrived, which image is that, which model, all the metadata extraction it basically start taking place. Um, so there's a whole transformation um, element as images are arriving, basically there's a continuous process that takes place to move the data from that production server, going to the cloud and you saw all the technology elements basically process through that uh, piece. And then there's a different types of data layers that are basically created as part of that. And that is the data layer that enables, you, know, you saw earlier, some of the capability of the tool itself, uh, whether it's the image query or whether it is uh, data viz app earlier that you saw there. Um, and challenge and learning, right? So of course, this is no easy task. Um, I can tell you that this could be one of the complex use cases ever on the production floor, right? Uh, and you know, as sounds as you can simple, it, it feels like I'm showing the diagram, but challenges are enormous. And I think we have been able to look into those challenges, able to solve to, to a very great extent, but quite a bit of work that has to happen, right? So different cameras, automated machine suppliers. So think about suppliers, there are different suppliers there for different products. So some products are liquid products, some are could be uh, lyophilized, which is mostly like a cake. Some are syringe, some are using vial. So the physical containers are different, right? Uh, tablets could be a different one, but in this case, we're not using for tablets. So all of a sudden you see that, and some manufacturers have 26 cameras, some are using only five, some are only three and one, right? So how do you come up with, common approach where you are having uh, models which can handle all those scenarios. Unfortunately, since different manufacturers are supplying that, literally you have to go and develop the models for each type of supplier and machines. Um, so the number of models are going to be very high depending upon what kind of product it is and what supplies is. So it is not like you develop model once and you apply everywhere for every manufacturer. Literally, you have to take case by case basis, right? The other element is the product variation. So think about lighting conditions, right? We're in production floor. Camera has a lens, right? You might have a dust coming in. Um, somebody might touch the camera by, by mistake. Um, the raw material itself, right? So uh, bile is made up of glass. Right, and they are coming from different manufacturers. What if that's a shoulder uh, slope on a vial is a little different, slightly off than the other manufacturer, right? But your model is just one looking at all, all as if they're coming from same, but they're not. So how do you handle the variation in your physical vial, variation of the conditions on the production floor? All those are different variations, right? And it's very difficult to include those variations in advance. So again, I think the whole idea behind AIML model is that you continuously retrain the model supplying the new set of data and then um, model become mature, right? But if you're using the rule-based model, a rule-based approach where no AIML model, then literally you have to go back and change your coding for every variation. And anytime you make a change for various and you have to make sure that you're not impacting, you know, other steps in your logic um, to do that, right? Uh, data is arriving at a different time. So, you know, you saw the data lake data is coming uh, earlier and then the model is coming a little later. So how do you, if the data is arriving at different times, you want to bring all everything together. So when the user is looking at that, at that time, they're looking at the data incomplete, not half the data has arrived, half not. So how do you handle that? You want to make sure that when the user is looking at, they are looking at the complete picture, not the data is arriving different times, so you're showing them only half of it, right? And we talked about the common structure. So how do you want to have a common structure that you are able to handle different types of products, um, different manufacturer data coming in, so putting together common data architecture is again, a pretty big challenge. 
and the data controls, right? So you want to make sure that um, the data coming in, you're not losing any anything in the transformation process or move, movement process, right? So transportation of data coming in, how do you know the data was created here in the beginning? When it arrives at the end, you, you didn't lose anything in between, right? So what kind of control can we put place for that as well? And here are some of the key learning sites. So the idea behind is that, um, you know, business driven, right? So this was purely from the business point of view is business has the ownership that, you know, this is a real use case and um, you, you want the ownership, right? So this driven by a business value to that. Our product mindset, so anytime we develop a solution as you can see how it has been branded a Hawk AVI, so the idea is the product mindset is that when you develop these kind of data solutions, you don't assume them as a project, they assume as a product, meaning there's a whole never ending cycle. So think about, you know, you bought a, let's say a pen. The pen manufacturer today, they are not making the same pen every year, right? Because that's a product for them. They want to go back and understand, okay, what is the experience of the people who are using our pen? What kind of experience can we provide? I guess I took the example very simple. You know, pen is a very simple example, but think about any iPhone, any any kind of product, you know, Apple. Why would Apple make the same thing year over year, right? Because you are giving the product mindset. Here we are, we're gonna release this product next year and next year and so on. Similar concept applies with this kind of AI driven model as well, that you want to treat them as a model in Version one, this is capability is this. Next version product will give more capability, more models, right? Um, there's a whole release plan that you have to basically plan and to do that. Um, and also, you know, since there's a lot of engagement from a lot of users, so you, how do you want to communicate and bring them on board in terms of um, make sure that the tool that has been developed, it's it's they are getting a good experience out of that, right? so they can adopt it. So now think about the powerful insights they're giving, right? The experience that they're getting using the tool is, is really, really great. And they are going to adopt, use this tool in their decision-making process, right? And then here are some of the, um, some of the other, you know, learnings that I have basically listed um, to do that. So with that, I think I might be at the end, Uday. I'm happy to take questions. So we got, uh, at least 12 minutes for Q&A. Okay, great. I will uh, I will read out the questions uh, which have come here and then we'll see. Okay, so uh, this is a question about calibration. So let me let me read out the question. Sure. Uh, uh, how to calibrate part of instrumentation important uh, with all type of defects, uh, 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 all types of defect samples in data? Uh, is it possible to include defect sample in data control? Uh, if you can, so I, I'm trying to understand the question itself. So maybe Uda, can you translate me uh, what you understand? Okay, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me also. Uh, you know, it's it's talking about different type of defects in the sample data, and uh, how would you you know uh, calibrate this different uh, different kind of uh, defects? In the sense, uh, uh, do you have any controls for this? Oh, within. So those are. Is he talking about the red um, ejected population? Are we talking yeah, there? It, I think he's talking about the ejected population. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think that there's, I believe there's a whole control limit there as well, right? So, um, because you have to, I believe that you have to report as to what is happening. So, and listen, I'm not a manufacturing expert. I'm an AIML person, right? So. I, I may not be able to answer that question because that's more on people who are expert on the manufacturing side of it. I'm assuming there got to be a calibration process. 
okay um if you want to know about how the model works how the solution works i'm happy to do that but in terms of drug manufacturing process and how the sample is taken i think probably i'm not the person to okay so we'll we'll restrict the questions with the machine learning and the ai aspect of that and That's the right. modeling as modeling aspect I bet. okay sure yeah yeah Sorry, I should have uh, clarified that I'm not I'm not a manufacturing pharmaceutical expert in the manufacturing side. Right. Uh, right. I understand the business process really, really well, but if you ask any technical manufacturing piece, I may not be able to answer that. Okay, great. I think you know in in the beginning your introduction, I think you missed it out, and even I didn't give. So if you would just like to quickly, you know, uh, do that. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there's a control chart, right? So I'm assuming the, the whole idea behind the chart is that they're watching based on what the sample manual piece is taking place, where things are basically going, right? So if all of a sudden you see that certain type of defects are creeping in through the control point, then there might be something you know to look into that um, and go back and, and try to calibrate. So I'm assuming calibration meaning there's a control limit defined as part of the pie chart that you see. I can see that happening. Okay. So how is that tuned? Um, I think that I'm assuming there got to be a process whereby you can adjust your your control limits um, to make certain decisions whether something is um, below the control limits or above the control limits. Okay. Let me. Uh... Let me take the next question. There are several, but let sure. me uh, switch off. Uh, there is a question that he's saying, thank you for the presentation, very nice. Can you speak a little bit about validation approach for validating the uh, machine learning models features? Yeah, that's uh, a good question. Yeah. yeah, and I can, yeah. So I can, I can speak on that. So just to let you know that right now we have not validated because Again, I, I told you that this is a diagnostic tool we are using outside, outside GMP process for diagnostic purposes only. We are working towards, so think about if the model is mature enough, right? At some point of time down the line, we have trained the model to the extent that it is close to almost 100% accurate, right? At that time, then you can go back and, and uh, validate that and, and put as part of the machine itself. We're making progress in that direction, right? Uh, we're working with that, but uh, at this time we we have not kind of made is a GMP uh, process, including the model, right? But we're working on it, um, and it will take some time, right? So we got guidance from FDA and other regulatory bodies looking into that, and and there are very different techniques coming in, um, coming into to explain them sometime right now model can say hey i found this defect but it'll be interested to see okay how did you come to that conclusion model tell me right so there's a whole ex ex explainability element that is kind of evolving um so model can basically tell that hey this is how i found the features and this is how i came to determination so if you can bring some explainability as part of this one i think that becomes much more easier to put in, in in part of the overall in the validation process there's a whole complexity in that piece so uh, short answer to your question is we are working on it but the model that you just saw it is is a business tool not a gmp tool just for diagnostic point of view great uh, uh can you give brief uh, some information about supervised models or an unsupervised machine models did you mention something about supervised and unsupervised models? I did not, but I can talk about that. So <clears throat> yeah. this is a supervised model. So the idea behind the supervised model is that you are, we are giving a label data to machine to learn. So we say that, hey, here is what, um, here are some of the images, sample images, what the crack looks like. Here is what well marks looks like. <clears throat> and here's what, you know, splash looks like. So you're giving giving them a label data, known data to the machines. They can relate that. 
that's a supervised learning. Unsupervised learning that basically you're not giving the label data. It just determines itself <clears throat> whether something is defective, what kind of defect is not. So obviously this is, you know, normally all these models are trained model. At some point we'll, we'll come to unsupervised learning at some time in future, but this time it is supervised learning. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another question. You you gave one use case which was in uh, uh, packaging inspection uh, in the in the manufacturing process. Will you be able to briefly just mention what could be the other use cases in uh, manufacturing and quality management in pharmaceuticals for machine oh, learning and AI? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So we are in pharma. So let me give another example. So <clears throat> think about in pharma. So especially on you know, a drug substance, right? So you, you take your, um, you start from uh, what we call cell expansion, right? As you're going through the whole cell expansion process and you're transferring your, um, your vessel, right? How you're expanding your cells and you're transferring one vessel to another vessel, right? It keeps on growing. So think about when do we want to transfer from one vessel to another? Hmm. Right now, the way the process works is that as expansion is taking place, you go and take a sample and you say, here's a cell density, right? A viable cell density work called VCD. So if you have to go back and find out, you take a sample at a certain interval and you say, okay, now it's ready to be transferred to the next one because now we got the maximum, I know, viable cell density. Now that is a manual process and sample based. Imagine, and you're taking a certain interval, you might you might miss the window of your sampling. It might be too early or too, might too late. So all of a sudden you see, if you're not right in time, it's too early, then you lost the, you know, the viral cells. If it's too late, then you're losing this viral cells as well, right? So either way, it has to be optimum time. So one of the use cases that we have worked on whereby there's a whole continuous um, at the cell expansion taking process, you capture more real-time data and tells you that this is now a good time for, for you to transfer your cell. Perfect, so now you can maximize your, your expansion um, for the seed transfer as taking place as you move it from reactor to reactor. Pretty powerful, right? Otherwise, you can always almost guessing game when you take the time-based uh, unit to do that, right? So that's one scenario. The other, Use cases are whereby if we really want to, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, maintenance point of view, right? So think about, we want to run the production, you know, 24-7 uh, as much as we want to produce and something in, breaks in between. You have to shut down your plant. Is there any, any way we could predict that's, you know, based on the data, something going to break in, you know, next week or next hour, or whatever the period is. So you can maintain proactively rather than while the production is running, right? So predictive maintenance in other place whereby you could, you could use the AI ML uh, for making sure that things are not breaking down um, while things are happening, you can take the proactive steps to do that. So those are some of the other use cases as well. Um, clinical side, there are quite a number, right? So clinical side, totally different ball game, but um, there are so many use cases. Supply chain, uh, another area that you can basically see, you want to predict um, in case, where do we think how soon uh, a product will reach to certain uh, space based on you know all the information you have how it is transported and things of that nature. Um, there's a whole product segmentation element in supply chain. So there are use cases in supply chain, quite a number of them as well. So in, in pharma, manufacturing, supply chain, R&D, uh, clinical, um, uh, in clinical talking about that, one of the uh, very prominent use case almost every company is using is that um, you can use a real world evidence now, right? So uh, it is not only, uh, clinical trial not based on um, what a product that you are basically testing for clinical trial. You might get some other information from third part outside 
hospital information, patient information, you can collect and those information to use for clinical trial as well. So quite a wide range of use cases. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. And I think with that, we have come to the end of our time. It's uh, 5 p.m. Uh, there are several other questions, but we will not go because most of them are relating, thing, uh, relating you know, with the manufacturing technology and how do you do that. So we will restrict the questions to machine learning and AI itself. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think with that, we can, you know, come to the end of this webinar. So any Vijay, any concluding remarks you would like to just give, you know, before we close this uh, thing, uh, close this webinar? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the, for the audience, I, I, I don't know uh, the audience, um, are they mostly manufacturing? Are there are people who are mostly in AI ML? Um, I can I can talk in general. I think there are there are uh, use cases. We talked about that. One thing I would say, if you are someone um, on on involved in the manufacturing process, one thing you want to make sure that you capture the data right from the beginning. One of the challenge we are trying to do he address here is we are trying to retrofit after the fact. So think about uh, vision machines, right? Vision machines say 10 years ago, they said, listen, I'm not going to save your images forever. I'm going to save, I take the camera, takes the picture, and we got a limited storage capacity in that. And I'm going to save that image for two hours. And after that, I'm going to overwrite. Imagine if that is the case, then you will never get access. If you don't take out the images before it over overwritten, then you will never get access to those images. So, I, so going forward, I would recommend that you want to make sure that you capture all the data related to any process before it gets overwritten. So you can have the data for any type of future uh, model development because that is a very critical piece. So um, that's definitely something I will advise. Data is still the big challenge. Thank you. Thank you for this excellent presentation, Vijay, because it really went into details of machine learning and AI. Because you know we have seen so many uh, conferences and presentations where people talk about machine learning and AI, but nobody goes into technical details. So thank you so much with this use case where you went into the technical details of uh, machine learning and AI. Thank you so much. With no this, problem. we will with this we will come to the end of this webinar. Delegates, thank you today joining here in such large numbers. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your trust and your faith in us. Please do join us on July 14th at 7 p.m. for a very interesting webinar on planning for FDS increased focus on quality management, maturity, and quality ratings. With this, have a good evening. Have a good week ahead of you. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you.